we're all here tonight um, to hear about dog sledding. Tonight's presentation is by Paul Shirky. Uh, he's going to be talking about dog sledding, making the winter wilderness accessible to everyone. He's the founder and director of Wintergreen Dog Sledding, and he and his team have been a part of the business for many years. Paul is able to spend time with most of his wintergreen trips and often is able to share an evening of stories about his expeditions. And he's with us tonight from one of those trips. Um, he's the lead instructor on most of the advanced dog sledding camping trips and the Arctic programs that they do. Um, he received the Explorers Award from the International Center for Exploration, the Adventure of the Year Award from Outside Magazine, and the Environmental Hero Award from the National Wilderness Society. He went to the North Pole with, um, with Will Steger and, um, and was part of that expedition and has been part of a number of other expeditions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul now. Thanks, Rand. Yeah, and uh, welcome to our Minnesota Rover friends. This is a fun reunion because we've had a fun association with the Rovers over the years. In fact, some of you have done trips with us. And in particular, a shout out to Audrey Sheffield, who's been with us. And we've uh, been on many adventures together, and she's been involved with the Rovers off and on over the years as well. So uh, great to reconnect with the Rovers and all the good you work you do to uh, engage Minnesotans and others with um with our wonderful outdoor world up here. Um, this is a pretty low tech program tonight. We've just got some scrolling random images from Wintergreen to keep the uh, visual component of this alive. So I'm, just, I'm not just rattling away here as a total bobblehead, but uh, uh, so not a lot of structure to this. I'll just kind of share our story with you and you can enjoy the scenes as you see them there that give you a little hint of what goes on in the world of Wintergreen. Um, and uh, but truth be told, I'm a city boy. Grew up at Fiftieth and Nicollet. For those of you in Minneapolis, um, being around South Minneapolis, and then um, had uh, uh, got my adventure roots uh, when I was young in there, maybe nine or ten years old. When an amazing adventure phenomena fell into my lap because we lived uh, right alongside the big ditch, as it was called, where they carved out what is now 35W, the interstate highway system through um, downtown Minneapolis. But that big ditch and the many years of excavation to create that was a giant adventure playground for I and my buddies as we'd ramrod around there on our banana seed high-rise handlebar bicycles up and down the dirt piles in the gravel um, and play F troop and bomb each other with dirt balls and the usual shenanigans that kids do at that age. But we just couldn't believe uh, as disruptive as it was to those neighborhoods. For us, it was a huge adventure playground and somehow it triggered an adventure uh, gene in me because it led to uh, hitting the trail and go going far beyond the confines of South Minneapolis and all the years since. But oddly enough, I, I do uh, in, in that great life's great game of connect the dots as I think back to where this all be began. I think it was banging around those gravel piles and uh, and excavations of uh, what is now uh, Interstate Highway System in Minneapolis and. A fun fact that no one share that I have yet, I, I don't know if that I ever quite fess up to my parents, but the peak life experience uh, in that adventure chapter was the summer when they um, finished the big ditch and they installed the giant drainage tile system that goes all the way through the center of that big ditch from downtown Minneapolis to Richfield. And it's a six foot diameter concrete pipe that goes right down the center of the highway as a storm drainage for rainwater hitting that highway. And my little buddies and I discovered uh, on a lark that if, uh, if we pedaled, pedaled, pedaled our banana seat bicycles all the way to downtown Minneapolis where the old, I think it was the Sheridan Hotel was, we could slink down into the big ditch and uh, look around, make sure no one was watching. Then we'd lower our bikes through a manhole cover into that six foot diameter concrete pipe. And the fun, the fun discovery was it's largely a downhill run from there to at least Lake Street, if not beyond, I forget now. Anyways, we, we'd pick up uh, tremendous momentum when we go rocketing through that six foot tunnel in total darkness. 
Uh, and the only point of uh, connection we would see along the way was this occasional flash of light when we'd go underneath another manhole cover. But otherwise, uh, it was just a complete dark mystery ride at about 20 miles an hour or more. Uh, and uh, it, a lot of fun at the time. We couldn't believe what an adrenaline rush it was, although, because I think back now and realize that if we had hit a brick or a piece of rebar or something and trashed ourselves, no, no one would have ever known what happened to Paul and Dale Van Blarkham and their buddy Bob Weiss and all the other knuckleheads that went with me in that storm tunnel. But anyways, it's a good thing because look where it led. Here we are today, still doing crazy stuff but, um, uh, and having fun doing it. So, uh, and then my parents had also set the stage nicely for us because um, growing up in a family of six kids and kind of bouncing off the walls at our house here in suburban or um, urban Minneapolis, uh, they knew we needed an outlet for uh, letting go of our youthful energy. So when I was also about nine or 10, um, they bought a pressure release valve for us kids, which was a pile of uh, a, an acreage of wild river property on uh, the headwaters of the Apple River, not the craziness by Somerset where all the frantic shenanigans go on there, but north, north of there, um, in a lovely expanse of wild forest area. And uh, mom and I, dad worked as a, for the city of Minneapolis and would commute to work from our camp property on the Apple River. But my buddies, my brothers and I would just bomb up and down the Apple River having these wild huckleberry fin adventures, um, creating building rafts and living off the land and learning how to make do with cattail roots and, and arrowhead tubers and whatever else we could find and eat on the fly. Um, and that really uh, uh, kind of propelled me along with the adventure fun that we were having during youthful summers on the Apple River, which is still near and dear to me to this day. But along the way, the other thing that uh, triggered the, my interest was um, uh, we, my parents were uh, staunch, uh, loyal members of the Lutheran Church, an odd little, very conservative branch of it called the you know, Norwegian Lutheran Synod, which is about as uh, as conservative as it gets in the in the world of Lutherans. Um, but they had one good thing going for them. They had a, a great little outdoor uh, program for kids called Lutheran Pioneer Boys. Well, and Lutheran Pioneer Girls, too, for that matter. But the Lutheran Pioneer Boys was kind of the Lutheran version of the Boy Scouts, because, of course, the Lutherans are pretty sure all the Catholics were going to hell. So they had, they had to have their own program. They couldn't do Boy Scouts. And Boy Scouts was known to be a thoroughly Catholic program at the time anyways. But the Boy Scouts, Lutheran Pioneer Boys. We did a great thing because uh, once we went, jumped through all the hoops and earned our merit badges, once we learned how to properly fold a flag and ditch a tent and tie a square knot and so forth, you would eventually score enough points that you would gain this mythical reward, which was to go to this mystery place called the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, bum, 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 which sounded like, you know, some nirvana or something. Of course, us kids from the city had no idea what that was all about, but when the summer when I was 11, I think it was, I earned the points, made the mark, and off we went. And my dad was a troop leader, so it was particularly special to share it with dad. <clears throat> and it was a total peak life experience because I just couldn't believe how drop dead beautiful uh, the Boundary Waters is and this whole expanse of northern Minnesota. Uh, and in particular, I remember um, a peak life experience because we were out on Washington Island for those who know Basswood Lake and the Boundary Waters with all my Lutheran Pioneer Boy buddies, and we were all wearing our green Lutheran Pioneer Boy shirts with all our medallions hanging on there and our red kerchiefs with our little bison hide slide that held our kerchief in place. And we looked cool as could be. And we were playing kick the can one evening on the island where we were camped. Uh, and uh, off in the distance was a golden orb of a sunset and their loons were calling. And then we were enchanted to see a bear cub scampering on the far shore. And I seized on that moment, um, and I can draw on that moment uh, as if it happened yesterday, even now. Uh, it was so um, um, impactful for me at that impressionable young age. And I knew that somehow, some way, I would call this place home someday. Um, and so that's at the stage. It's funny how those little odd quirks early on uh, propel you down the road of life. And that one certainly did. Uh, just that moment playing kick the can on, on Washington Island of Basswood Lake. Uh, so I schemed to dream my way through high school and college to carve out a career that would allow me to call the Northwoods home and uh, landed myself at a wonderful university, 
which I'm engaging with here tonight, um, since I'm in, in the company of colleagues um, from St. John's University here in Ely tonight, part of a, a wintergreen trip we're involved with with them. Um, and uh, the uh, St. John's was pivotal in my adventure schemes as well, because I had never put a pair of skis on until I went to St. John's. But St. John's is this wonderful forest reserve. Um, and uh, uh, skiing came with the package part of the territory. Uh, and I hit it hard while I was there and absolutely fell in love with glis gl glissading my way through the winter woods um, and realized that skiing was a great way to uh, engage in um, winter adventures as well. And more significantly, while at St. John's, um, during my senior year, my uh, college classmate, still my best bud, um, and my beer drinking buddy at the La Playette. Who's been to La Playette? In this room, everybody in this room has got their hands up. If you know St. Joseph, Minnesota, it's the go-to place, the La Playette beer joint. Uh, in any case, um, Greg Lace and I, uh, we were, with all our youthful energy at St. John's, uh, we won release for that. It was the hot button political issue at the time, which was uh, protection for the Boundary Waters. Back, I'm um, dating myself here because this was back in the late 70s. Uh, huge political issue in Minnesota. Political heads rolled. People lost their seats in office over clamor about the Boundary Waters and whether setting this aside as a nationally protected wilderness was either a federal land grab or a way to ensure that something this precious would be there for uh, people to enjoy in posterity. In any case, um, so we jumped into the fray, got very politically engaged, went back and forth to the state capitol lobbying. Um, and um, the one of the arguments being made at the time by folks keen on maintaining the use of motorized transport in the boundary waters, folks were keen to continue to putter around in their motorboats and their, and their Piper Cub airplanes and their snowmobiles out there, they argued, that without motorized access, you, you would deny enjoyment of the area by people who were disabled, who used wheelchairs or crutches or were deaf or blind or whatever. Well, as it happens, my college buddy, Greg, has a mild congenital disability. Doesn't affect what he does too much, but he's sensitive to those issues. And he knew this was a crack of poop when they were making that argument right from the get-go, because he knew from uh, his connections with people uh, who have disabilities that they enjoy experiencing nature on its own terms, just, just as anyone does. So we decided to call their bluff on that argument. And in the summer of 77, we put together a circle of friends who were disabled, uh, two guys who were deaf, a woman who used a wheelchair, someone else who had cere cerebral palsy and had a walker, uh, a friend who was blind. There were about 10 of us um, and went off on a, a Boundary Waters adventure. Uh, and we happened to, con we were lucked out, we cajoled a reporter from the New York Times to come along to see where this adventure might lead. Well, we got into a much bigger deal than we bargained on, and, and it was um, nip and tuck for a while to bring us all out alive, but we did. And we came out smiling, despite some interesting setbacks and close calls along the way. Um, and the writer for the New York Times did a beautiful front page piece in the New York Times Sunday Magazine a month or two later. Um, it was an extraordinary reflection on the experience we'd all had together. More significantly, it actually moved the dial politically on the issue because we really did hit the mark on that trip, um, driving home the point that uh, we don't need to pander to people with disabilities by giving them a snowmobile to go out and enjoy the outdoors. They can enjoy the outdoors the same as any of us can. Um, and we learned on that trip that with little creativity and some adaptive equipment, even folks with significant mobility impairments could, could enjoy um, a, a Boundary Waters canoe trip. Um, and we also realized we were onto something pretty cool because enjoying the wilderness with such an interesting mixed group uh, proved such a peak life experience that uh, we wanted to do more of that. So off we went. Um, we uh, were able to secure some seed money from a few foundations in Minnesota. And that launched a program uh, that's now known as Wilderness Inquiry. It's uh, grown quite large and done very well. And my buddy Greg and I kind of ran it together to usher it along for the first several years. Um, and he continued to uh, 
be the grand poo about the whole program for his 40 more years. Um, and now he's moved on to do other things, but the program um, through, through lives and thrives just fine and doing great work all over the world to engage people um, with all kinds, with and without disabilities on uh, mixed wilderness adventures. So for the, our first several years, uh, Greg and I maintained our day job doing other things. I was a journalist and Greg was an administrator for some nonprofit programs. But our summer vacation time was given over to doing these canoe trips through what we called Wilderness Inquiry with uh, registrants who had various disabilities as well as people who were not disabled. So the whole thrust was doing it with mixed groups so people could focus on the fact that the things that we share in common are far more significant than the physical issues on which we might differ. And nothing underscored that more um, uh, effectively than, than a wilderness adventure. So our summers were spent doing these trips, had a great time. We both met our spouses through that. That was a thinly veiled uh, excuse for doing the program that we are hoping to find some like-minded adventurous females out there with whom we could uh, spend our lives. And we both did. So we're grateful for that in a huge way. My wife, Susan, and great wife, Patty. Um, and, um, but it also led to dog sledding. And I know that's the pro reason for our talk tonight here. Uh, and so initially the wilderness quarry trips were summer canoe trips. The canoe lent itself extremely well to accommodating people with disabilities, but the program was so much fun for Greg and I, we both wanted to dump our day jobs and just do this year round. <clears throat> but the issue was what would be the summer counterpart to the canoe to accommodate people who are disabled. And we hung out at Midwest Mountaineering with all the other outdoor junkies in Minneapolis and friends there said, Hey, you should check, check out dog sledding. Well, we were in our 20s and we were late bloomers to the dog sledding game. Uh, we didn't know anything about it, but they said, yeah, there's this guy up by Ely. He's way back in the woods. He's got dog teams. He's kind of an interesting dude. Maybe he would give you a hand. So, uh, so we made our way to Ely, Minnesota in the winter of 79 and asked around at the local bars where we could find this guy that had dog teams that might be amenable to hearing us out. And, uh, so we got the proverbial hand-drawn map on the back of a bar napkin and blundered our way miles through the woods uh, to uh, this little cliff-top cabin <laughs> with no road access where lived this bit of a hermit doing his thing with his dog teams. And we laid our wrap on him about how he wanted to try this experimental trip with friends who were disabled. And would he be so kind to jump into the fray with us? And yeah, he said, sounds cool. Bring it on. Well, his name is Will Steger, and he went off on an experimental trip with us in the January of 79 with another hand-picked circle of friends with different disabilities. And it, too, was a peak life experience. We were out for a week in the Bondi Waters, and we got the full Monty. We got 40 Below. We got Howling Wolves. We got Northern Lights. We got it all. We got everything you'd want for a winter adventure. Um, and it worked. It clicked. And the folks on board who were disabled said, this is amazing. I can't believe I'd ever have a chance to do this. And the dog teams made it possible. So another life's epiphany for Greg and I got to realize that this was our ticket to ride. And more significantly for me, uh, I realized that uh, winter was, was where it was at. Dogs in winter. Um, and you can have the rest, as Roald Amundsen once said. And I saw it clearly there on that trip. So now Wilderness Inquiry suddenly had a winter component to the program. And I had a uh, life's mission because uh, I was dove in deep into the dog setting deal in a big way. And our connection there, Will Steger and I became close friends. Um, Sue and I moved up to live in his little clifftop log cabin and join him uh, in operating what then was called Lynx Track Winter School. Uh, and um, that, uh, well, the rest is history. That, that Will, Will introduced me to the Arctic um, and Ann Bancroft and our colleagues that joined us on all our early Arctic expeditions. And then uh, Lynx Track Winter School segued into Wintergreen Dog Sled Lodge, where we, I, Susan and I have, have enjoyed our careers and raised our family and continue to, and the, well, the beat goes on. We still uh, carry on with uh, the same ventures today. And uh, the other beautiful piece of the puzzle is uh, thanks to Will, uh, I was introduced to the Arctic, an amazingly beautiful place, uh, which I love dearly, uh, and, and joined him for our, my first trip to the Arctic in 1984. And by hook or crook, I have had some excuse to go to the Arctic 
every year since, well, except for COVID now, they've kind of shut things down for a bit. We're hoping to reboot this next spring, but um, but interesting, I'm very grateful to, well, the Boundary Waters and Ely, Minnesota and Will um, and Greg for making all these connect the dots possible that uh, brought us where we are today. And of course the dogs, the dogs are the key piece of the, uh, of the puzzle here. Um, and of course, dogs come with the package here in Ely, Minnesota, because Ely's famous for a lot of things, one of which we're home to the largest viable pack of timber wolves in the continental U.S. And we're also home to the closest canine cousins to all those timber wolves because the dogs we were proudly, that we proudly have at Wintergreen are pretty special. We are number one because of the 485 known breeds of dogs out there, depending on who's counting. And all known breeds of dogs, of course, evolved from timber wolves. Um, but the ones whose DNA, who are most genetically uh, associated with wolves, are Canadian Inuit dogs, which is what we probably have at Wintergreen Lodge here. Um, so the Canadian Inuit dogs were the first ones out of the hopper when uh, wolves, those fearsome predators, became uh, somewhere somewhere way back to 12 to 15,000 years ago when wolves became kitchen floor fur balls that we have today with all the dogs out there. Um, and um, uh, so we have this very historic breed of dogs, which given their close connection to timber wolves are very rough and tumble animals. They live to pull, they love to pull, an amazing instinct that's just plug and play. There's no training required. Um, you just kind of prompt the instinct when they're physiologically mature at about eight months old and off they go. The harnesses go taut and and uh, they go nuts every chance they get to slip in the harness and pull those sleds. Um, and lucky us too, although they're very closely related to wolves and they have many wolf-like characteristics, they're also friendly, friendly to a fault. Um, if you so much as pass them a passing glance, they'll uh, turn around to uh, solicit some affection and uh, until you steer them forward again and, and the harness goes taut and, and uh, they carry on uh, with their uh, power performance. So they've been, they've been a real gift too along the way to have had these wonderful friends, all the hundreds of Inuit dogs that have been part of the winter green kennel, that, which we've now been part of for 40 plus years, it seems to me. Well, you can, you can do the math. <laughs> Our first year with Wintergreen would have been, we started with Will in 79, and then we uh, created our own property and homestead and dog sledding base in 87. And we're still putting along there today. So anyway, it's been a long, wonderful ride uh, with things near and dear to me. Well, my family, first and foremost, Susan, and then our three grown kids, Bria, Peter, and Barrett. We've all been home here over the holidays to help out with our trips. And then, of course, our, our bluff dogs that are so key to the program and that um, have been part of the project right from the beginning. So, uh, but these dogs, um, and the fun thing with our Arctic connection as well, of course, these dogs made life in the Arctic possible because um, the Arctic is a surprisingly happening place. There are actually several million people on the planet who live north of the Arctic Circle. Um, most best known of those are the Inuit people, um, of which there are, well, maybe 50,000, which wouldn't even fill a mid sized American town, but yet everyone knows about Inuit people because they live in such a unique part of the planet, a part of the planet where it's dark for five, six months of the year and then full bar daylight the rest of the year. And it's mostly snow and ice all the time, but they, it's home it's, uh, and they love it. Uh, and they've evolved a life up there in concert with the Inuit dog uh, over their some seven, 8,000 years of cultural history. Um, because if you remember from high school uh, science classes, the further north you go, the bigger the animals get. And you think the Arctic, you think polar bear and walrus and ring seal and, and uh, beluga whales and so forth. Um, it has to do with surface to, uh, surface to body weight ratio and heat retention in cold places. So there's lots of big animals up there, plenty of food on the hoof to eat, but um, they're far and few between. So you got to travel a long distance to find vittles for grandma and grandpa and the kids. Um, and the dogs made that possible because uh, once Inuit people evolved 
in concert with the dogs, they could travel the distance needed to find food and carve out uh, a living and a lifestyle in the Arctic. Um, and that, um, that continued unabated, oh, until probably the late 50s, early 60s. And then, of course, uh, the internal combustion engine made its debut in the Arctic and kind of took over life up there like it did everywhere else on the planet. Uh, and snowmobiles became all the rage. And it was a sad turn of fate for the Inuit dog because they were just kind of abandoned or dispatched um, and forgotten by the villages. Um, uh, but there's, um, in more recent times, there's been an interesting renaissance because the dogs are back. Um, the Inuit dog has enjoyed a resurgence in a big way. It's become a point of pride for much of Arctic Canada. The new flag, for example, of the semi-sovereign terrain of Nunavut Arctic Canada features the Inuit dog as its uh, as its logo and, and iconic image, um, and the dogs are back in the villages as well. Um, in part because people realize the long cold winter and hard to snuggle up to a snowmobile, but dogs are at least a source of companionship and an emotional connection and and something to do during long dark winters. So, so there's been uh, we we've, we've enjoyed during our tenure in the Arctic in the last forty years to. Um, see this uh, resurgence of the Inuit dog and, of course, a point of pride for us as well since here in Ely, Minnesota at Wintergreen, we have, for whatever it's worth, we have the largest kennel of Inuit dogs anywhere in the U.S. And uh, no, no big deal there. It's just that no one else has a reason to have this unusual breed of Arctic dog and, and um, put it to the work for which it's, uh, for which it's um, destined and, and wired uh, as we can with all of our trips. Um, so we've been on a bit of a mission over the years to maintain the integrity of the breed. Um, and then we've kind of mixed and matched breed stock with our friends in the Arctic. Since we travel to the Arctic most every year, over the years, we've brought some of our dogs to Arctic villages and they've given some of us some of theirs in return, just so we can shake up the gene pool and keep the genetics clean in our, um, our lines of, of this um, unusual breed of dog. Um, and, um, it's worked really well for us. We've had uh, good health with our dogs and, and um, we've got about 60 of the dogs here at Wintergreen now, which has kind of been our holding pattern number for, for a long time. Um, and it fits the bill just fine for us and for what we do with our, with our programs. The, um, and I'm going to just interject here for a moment because I'm mindful of the time frame. I know it's 7.35. Fran or Barry, maybe you can let me know. I think there was going to be some question and answer too. How are we doing on time here? Do we have contact with anybody? We're good, we're good so far. We're good so far. We can do Q&A. What would, what would and, uh, let me know, how are we do? what, uh, I understood that you're, you, these programs run for 40 minutes. I'm just mindful of 7.35. I can chat on as you choose, but what, when would you like us to switch to questions from your listeners? Whenever you're ready, whenever it works for you. I'm okay. Sure okay, thanks. Uh, we'll chat for five or 10 more and see if there's any questions and let people carry on with their evenings. So, um, and a particular intrigue to us with our Arctic connection with the dogs, um, has been our connection with the northernmost people of the world, um, which are the polar Eskimos in the northwest corner of Greenland, an extraordinarily unique circle of people who, until the late 1800s, were completely isolated and as a tribal community had no idea that there was anyone else on this planet uh, and lived in complete isolation up there um, with their dog teams to make life possible for them. Uh, and doing their own thing, timeless thing, until an American explorer showed up on his way to the North Pole. His name is Robert Perry. And he sort of discovered the polar Inuit um, and uh, went on to kind of tap their talents to make his attempts at reaching the North Pole possible. And did that, of course, in concert with their, with their key ingredient, which their key technology, which were their sleds and their Inuit dogs. Um, and uh, so a personal connection that we have treasured that came through that connection uh, is the fact that Robert Perry, uh, 
who was a rather privileged American born into a blue blood family in the East Coast and had the wherewithal and close friends with Theodore Roosevelt of all people to launch his huge projects and attempt to carve his name into history as the discoverer of the northernmost point of the planet. That was his life's mission. But he took on as his life's partner, interestingly, <clears throat> someone of a very different uh, social class, a black American named Matthew Henson. Um, the two of them became lifelong partners in this Arctic career together. And it, it, it shared several attempts at tra traveling across the Arctic Ocean by dog team to reach the North Pole. Um, and ultimately in 1909 claimed to have accomplished their life's mission. Um, but for those of you who may be aficionados of Arctic history, you might know that their claims to have this, having discovered the North Pole in 1909 are highly controversial. And to this day now, most folks doubt their, the credit of those claims and um, it continues to be a source of contention for Arctic historians. But interestingly, uh, along the way, Perry and Henson became closely endeared with the polar Inuit community that they kind of discovered, or at least brought to the attention of the greater world out there. Um, and uh, in fact, they became so endeared to the polar Inuit community that both of them fathered common law children with common law Inuit wives among that community. Uh, and when their polar exploring days were over in 1909, they left the Arctic behind them and they left behind as well these mixed blood Inuit uh, American children that they had fathered uh, with their Inuit consorts on these uh, expeditions. Well, those uh, children um, were fruitful and multiplied. And to this day in the polar Inuit, Inuit communities of Northwestern Greenland, many of the people up there bear the last name of Perry or Henson because they fall in the, the lineage that, that came from that odd connection with these with this black and white American explorer uh, 100 plus years back. Well, I, I first learned of that story oh, 20 years ago. It was intrigued to find, to meet these people who were descendants, who were mixed blood Inuit descendants of these uh, American explorers uh, and had the opportunity to go to Greenland on my first trip in the year 2000, I think it was. And I was in pursuit to find, I was particularly intrigued to find uh, the, the descendants of Matthew Henson, Black, Amer uh, Black Inuit um, people living in the high Arctic. And um, sure enough, on that trip, I met this man. His name is Usarka Henson. And he was sort of the main keeper of the Henson family flame in Greenland. And sure enough, he as well was very mixed blood. He had uh, Afro-American hair uh, and, and dark skin, darker even than most Inuit people. Uh, was quite proud of his connection to Matthew Henson, whom he had no memory of. He, Matthew left Greenland when uh, Usar Cox, uh, well, he was his great grandson, but when uh, Matthew's Inuit son was maybe two years old, Matthew left the Arctic forever and never went back. Uh, so Wooster Cock had no direct connection to his grandfather, but knew the, knew the story and was proud of his uh, grandfather as a Black American, against all odds, to become uh, a very accomplished uh, Arctic explorer. Um, and uh, so Wooster Cock and I became close friends over the years, and, and he joined us uh, as a, one of our guides on several wintergreen trips we did with the polar Eskimos of Northwest Greenland. We went on as well to uh, work with National Geographic to produce a documentary and the whole story of this bizarre connection between um, the Inuit people and the American explorers and the lineage that came from that. Um, and uh, well, if you're interested in that, you can find that documentary on our Wintergreen Dockside Live YouTube channel. It's called Ice, Ice Riders. It's a great, really excellent um, documentary film on the whole story of Ustercock and, and our connection with him. Um, and we savored that family connection all these years. We've done several trips to Northwestern Greenland to travel with the polar Inuit. Um, and uh, we're last there in the winter, spring of 2019. Uh, Ustercock was then 84 years old, as I recall now. Um, time had taken its toll. He was in kind of the um, rest home there in the little village of uh, Connacht, Greenland, where we spent some time with him. Uh, and uh, then let's see now, it would have been last fall, I think it was, he, we got word from Greenland that um, he, he had passed on, but we were deeply endeared, my whole family, 
Susie and I and all our kids had spent time with Mr. Cuck and his family in Greenland on our various trips. And uh, his relatives in Connick were pleased to share with us that at the little uh, memorial service in the, uh, in the um, uh, village hall there in Connick, Greenland, uh, they made a special point of acknowledging uh, our family friendship with Usrakuk and his clan all these years. So, so it had come full circle. With, um, and uh, so that was one of the points of our, our connections over the years that I find particularly endearing, having had a chance to both meet this connection to Matthew Henson, an American explorer who, who I'm uh, deeply intrigued with. And he, he, he wrote a beautiful biography himself and many books and, and movies have been done about Matthew Henson, although given the prevailing prejudice at the time back in 1909, most of his accomplishments were kind of swept under the rug since the East Coast Blue Bloods did not want to acknowledge that a Black American had anything to do with Robert Perry's claims to success. But but there's been a great effort since then to bring it all to light, what a significant um, uh, accomplishment Matthew Henson's life was all about. And, and, and of course, our family has been deeply proud and, and moved by this odd connection that we then had with it as well through our friendship with Usrakuk. Uh, and, and in fact, we hope to return to Greenland next spring if COVID allows, uh, and uh, we'll be catching up with his wife and children there again um, and have a chance to visit his grave in the community and pay our respects to a man uh, that has been such a central element of our uh, joy in, in uh, traveling the Arctic. Good. Well, I'll take a pause there and see what you think, Barry and Fran, if there's questions or how are we doing. There's a few questions in the chat, yeah. and if anyone else wants to ask questions, f please feel free to do so. And being the troglodyte that I am, you know, I probably can't even find the chat here on my phone, but if you can read me the questions, I'll answer them. <laughs> All right, so here's one for you. How do you keep the dogs active in the slumber? Yeah, so good question. Um, two things on that point. One is that these... Canadian Inuit dogs, they are Arctic animals. They go into a very distinct seasonal torpor, almost like a semi-hibernation, uh, where they're rather inactive all summer. You can just see their metabolism diminish with the summer the warmth, um, and they just snooze the summer away, which is true of their entire Arctic heritage. In the Arctic, they do the same. They snooze the summer away. And once the late summer when the Arctic or late fall here in Minnesota hits and the cool weather arrives, you can just feel the energy mount in that kennel. The howling starts each night as their um, mm. engines, engines rev up and off they go. Um, but in the summer, we also are able to put most of them into open pens where they have room to groove and socialize with each other, four, five, six dogs in open pen together. Some of the dogs- Some of the dogs- are not keen on that. They have issues and prefer to be on their tethers to know that they've got a very defined space. But the ones who are comfortable being an open and pen, we uh, can do that with them. And, and although they never really pursue any exercise in the summer, given their seasonal torpor, they have at least some space to chase around if they'd like. Any other questions? So someone else said, I grew up on the Apple River in Amory, Wisconsin. Was your place upriver from mine? Well, I'm glad you asked that because this summer I brought that experience full circle as well. Because having grown up on the Apple, I was long intrigued to see the whole thing. So this last late June, friends and I, uh, my, my brother and I and a cousin, uh, drove up to the headwaters of the Apple up by Cumberland, Wisconsin, a little place called Slate Lake dropped our canoes in the water, and off we went to see the entire thing unfold. Uh, interestingly, the Apple's a little river, but it, uh, it, uh, it uh, has a surprisingly big stature. It's, it's about 80 miles, 80 some miles long, which is actually a sizable river for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, it has quite a drop, about a thousand foot drop on its run from the Slate Lake to the St. Croix. Uh, and we were really, um, pleased and intrigued to find that to this day, much of the run was pretty wild and scenic. Obviously the Amory area is a long expanse of, of cabins and mom and pop resorts. Uh, but um, 
the, the, the much of the river was most of the river was surprisingly scenic. So we, it was just a three day run down the river and we camped along the way. Uh, and, uh, and a fun fact that no one tell the apple river, because it has a significant drop on its run to the St. Croix, it was a significant source of hydropower. So there were several hydro dams along the river. Uh, I think at its peak, there were seven, as I recall now. And over time, it has taken its toll on many of them and they blew out and were never replaced. Um, but there are still three operating hydro dams along the river. And then the one in Amory there, which is just a spillway, it's no longer a hydro dam. But here's something cool. It turns, we were all intrigued when, as I researched our plants to paddle the apple, which by the way, if you're looking for a fun river to paddle, it, it, it's, it's beautiful, it was a great paddle. Um, uh, but one of the dams to this day on the Apple River is the last privately owned hydroelectric dam in America. Um, so uh, it's uh, near a little village hamlet called Little Falls on the way down the river. But so we, as we approached that dam, it was one I'd never seen as a child. I knew the dam's closer to, we, we, our home was near Star Prairie. Our, our land and cabin was near Star Prairie, Wisconsin. Uh, so as we approached that dam, I was really intrigued to see what this, this, what this dam was all about. And sure enough, we come around the corner and there's this old 1880s hydroelectric dam there, big as day. And we pulled up and had a beautiful little county park alongside it where we pitched our tents to camp for the night. And there was a farm nearby. So I walked over to ask the farmer who owned that dam. And he, he said, well, Bob owns that dam. I said, well, I got to meet this Bob. When does he show up? He says, well, Bob comes by at nine every morning to check the meters. So sure enough, at nine in the morning, a pickup truck pulls up and it's Bob. And uh, I said, Bob, I can't believe it. She has to meet you. I told him my story growing up there in the Apple and how I was so keen to find out that he owns the last privately, private hydroelectric dam in the country. And so he said, oh, come on in, boys. Let me show you around. So he took us into the powerhouse and all these dials and meters and these huge dynamos, big bronze copper dynamos that had been spinning nonstop since the dam was built in 1880 something. Uh, it was it was really fun to meet to see this, and uh, uh, good for Bob because it turns out that on a good day when there's good flows in the apple, those meters spin out 400 bucks for Bob. So he's doing pretty well with that hydro dam there on the apple, and uh, really made for a fun trip for us. So if the rovers are looking for another great experience, the Apple River, although it's, it doesn't get much play as a canoeing river, I was we're, we're going to canoe it again next summer because it, it was really a, a beautiful river and a fun ride. Some very light white water, nothing that would throw you off. And then it, it ends at a beautiful gorge, the Apple River Gorge, which comes into the St. Croix. Uh, and then it's the uh, St. Croix Wildlife Islands chain at the exit, which was just thick with um, sandhill cranes. And we came off the end of the apple this spring. We, we saw quite a bit of wildlife along the way. We caught some great fish too. So anyways, that's my pitch for the Apple River. Anything else? Okay, how many lead dogs do you have in your kennel? How old are the dogs when you decide they could be lead dogs? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we've got well, 60 dogs at Wintergreen. Um, and my theory on the lead dog deal is not to pigeonhole the dogs by pegging them into certain positions. Um, for folks out in the rovers who know how the dog sledding world works, there's lead dogs in the middle, there's swing dogs. And then of course the dogs closest to the sleds are called wheel dogs, lead swing and wheel. Uh, and I'm always in discouraging our staff from pigeonholing dogs in particular positions as it reduces our flexibility when we have to change configurations of the team each day for the different group sizes that we might have on trail with us for different programs at Wintergreen. <clears throat> Furthermore, my experience has been that you give most any dog a chance out front and they'll, they'll do it. They'll, they'll initiate a lead. There's always a, a few odd ones in the kennel that come down the pike over the years that just don't want to be out front. It's too stressful for them uh, to initiate a lead, but most all of them will given half a chance. Um, we, we soon realize the ones for whom it's just not a fit and who knows why it's the odd personality quirk. Um, so I would have to say, given that, that I like to think that most all of our dogs will lead some certainly lead better than others. And if you ask any one of the 12 wintergreen guides, they all have their favorites and they'll talk your ear off about why so-and-so is a better lead dog than somebody else. Um, that's, and of course, that's just part of the fun of shop talk and the staff house every night when they discuss the day's uh, experiences and, and kind of review 
all the little dynamics of the dog world. But um, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they all they'll all I like to think they'll all run any which way we put them because mostly they're wired around this instinct to pull and they're just happy to do it wherever they get the chance. Anything else? Uh, what is the cost of a half day trip with the dogs? Thanks for the fun talk. Okay, great. Yeah, so our half day trips are uh, $200 for adults and their last for teens and kids. Um, and um, we, uh, uh, well, then this year we're largely fully booked for the season. We do have a few odd openings here and there, mostly for day trips or overnight trips are pretty much fully booked and waitlisted. You know, there's kind of this. Well, I wish I could say it was a post-COVID rush, but we're not post-COVID yet by any means. Uh, but there is certainly a rush for people to get outside and do something. And of course, dog setting being outside is largely considered a COVID safe activity. Um, and uh, the silver lining and the COVID cloud for Ely is because we are the end of the road, especially now with the Canadian border having been closed. And yes, it is kind of open now, but it's still sort of sketchy and very few folks are bothering to go into Canada. So Ely is still the end of the road. So people are flocking up here and Ely is just bustling with activity and has been all through COVID for, for better or worse, uh, uh, as has Wintergreen as well. But um, but we would always welcome Rovers. We love Rovers and you, you do good work. And it's great that you are instilling uh, the outdoor adventure spirit uh, in uh, young people as part of your program and, and lots of new people now too. I'm assuming that COVID has brought new adventures to your program as well with people looking to do stuff outside, knowing that outside is safe. So, so thanks for letting me blather on tonight. We always love sharing our story and sharing the story of our dogs and especially with the, uh, an audience that uh, is as engaged in the outer doors as we are, the Minnesota Rovers. So appreciate you um, having us on here. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. All right. Have a good Thanks, evening. Paul.